John 5 is just one of those chapters that when you're reading it, you just begin to sense the weight of it. And even if you don't have the time to dig deep into it, it just always gets kind of earmarked as this chapter where you know there's a lot going on. Um, If you're familiar with it, I'm here to share with you this morning that, of course, in all Scripture there's a lot going on, right? Every verse of the Bible is shallow enough for a baby to play in, deep enough for an elephant to wade in. There's a lot going on in all of the living Word of God, but John 5 is taking us into the mystery of the Trinity as Jesus is standing before the religious mafia, and they had degenerated, devolved into a religious mafia. You think of your mafia movies and to cross the mob and to step out of line and to challenge them. That is who they had become. And Christ comes as God in the flesh to go up against them. And as he now is in this exchange with them, and it's really him sharing and them just looking at him like they want to kill him. Him just sharing and them just looking at him like they want to kill him. If looks could kill, I wouldn't be surprised if to find out the idiom was framed there because how many times does it say in the Gospels, then they wanted to kill him, right? Um, But what he is sharing and what he unveils, you know, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 tells us to consider Jesus. And in the Greek it means to place all your attention upon and to consider him. And John 5 comes along to remind us that Jesus Christ is God. John chapter 5 comes along to remind us that Jesus Christ is the lover of our soul, our Savior. He is God Almighty, the Ancient of Days. And John chapter 5 is here. And the only way I could kind of explain it as as from my little mind and, and heart is just as a Christmas sermon gets you really mesmerized all over again about the incarnation, right? How the creator put on clay, how the infinite became an infant. I got good news for you, you know, because we say, oh, every day, right, is Christmas. Every day is a celebration of the incarnation. You don't have to read just the story of the nativity. John 5 is one of those chapters, and I pray that after today, it just becomes one of your go-tos that will just rock you with the fact that God put on human flesh, that Christ stands and walked among us as God in the flesh. And really, it gets you to just stand in fresh awe of 1 Timothy 3.16. If you could just turn there, I'd like to read it. It says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, the mystery of how all of this took place. God was manifest in the flesh. The creator put on clay. The infinite became an infant. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, formed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of what tradition says was a teenage girl, 16, 17 years old. Tradition says God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then in all of this is the death, burial, and resurrection, and the ascension received up into glory in front of over 500 witnesses. Great is the mystery of godliness. As believers, we worship the true and living God. We are monotheists. What does that mean? That we believe there is one God. We are not polytheists. We do not believe that there are poly means many. We do not believe there are many gods. We are monotheists. We believe that there is one God, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt worship the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. We are monotheists. And having said that, we believe in one God, but... That one God exists co-eternally and co-equally in three distinct persons, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We do not believe in modalism, which is what some oneness Pentecostals is what they're called, ascribed to, where they say that God 
exists in three persons, but not coexisting, actually more so in modes. In the Old Testament, he was God the Father. During the Gospels, he was God the Son. And now he has changed modes into God the Holy Spirit. No, we are not modalists. We believe that they are co-eternal and co-existent. And where do you see that? You see that at the baptism of Jesus. You have Jesus standing there as God the Son, coming up out of the water. You hear God the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. Right there you see all three persons coexistent. So that alone should refute modalism. And mind you, um, I've been told that T.D. Jakes and even those who ascribe to modalism for a long time recently actually recanted it because it's, it's non-biblical. Uh, I would go as far to say as it's heretical, right? We believe in one God. We are monotheists, but we believe this one God exists in three distinct persons, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh, Let's go to John 5, and having laid that foundation, I just want to tell you all, I mean, I'm, this, I'm getting excited just kind of like leading up to it. I got rocked. I, I laid in bed. I've been up since 319 this morning. I told y'all don't turn 48. Things happen like that. Then I wake my wife up. Yo, you sleep? I know she's, I know she's sleep, <laughs> but she's not now, you know? Um, you know? But I laid there, and it's just like Lord Jesus I just want to know you more. I, I just want to worship you. I, I realize that what I've been calling worship lately is not even the worship you even deserve. The praise I give is not even the praise that you deserve. You are unbelievable. I want to know you. Can we start over? Amen? And isn't that what it's like? You only get saved once. But isn't the Christian life just a series of ahas, right? A series of light bulbs, a series of just fresh pledges of allegiance to the Lord because you just realize, wow, in fighting the good fight of faith, we are just fighting against that familiarity, right, that breeds a contempt. So what do we need? We need a fresh vision, a fresh encounter with Jesus. And where do we find that? Always in the Word of God, right? We have the book of the Lord so we can know the Lord of the book. John 5 rocked me in this way where it's just like, boom, God Almighty walked among us. God Almighty is my savior, my hero, my friend that sticks closer than a brother. Wow. I want to, don't know whether I want to hug you or just bow down before you and say, I'm not even worthy, right, to be in your presence, you know, and that's, that's what the, the tension of, 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 adoration, you know, and just the humbling of just deep, deep veneration. My prayer is that all of us just get rocked today by John 5. I want to get rocked even more. And let me tell you something. I think John 5 is so fire that it doesn't even need my little sesson or my little adobo on it. I think it's so fire that I could just read it and be like, yo, go find a park or a quiet corner and have a good day and do the same. But let's read. Let's read and let's be blessed. And let's pray again. Father, please speak to our hearts today. Lord Jesus, we want to see you. And we want to respond with the worship that John responded to on the Isle of Patmos, where he had walked with you for three and a half years, saw you in your resurrected glory. But then when he sees you on the Isle of Patmos decades later, he fell down as a dead man. Do that in our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So where is Jesus? Jesus is at Bethesda. Remember, all Jewish males were required to go to Jerusalem three times a year for three specific annual Jewish feasts, right? So it tells us in John chapter 5 that verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Again, in your notes, right, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Christ came to fulfill the law, right? Matthew 5, 17. And part of what the law commanded is that all Jewish males go up. If he did not keep all of the law perfectly to the T, then he would not have fulfilled being Messiah as he is. He came to fulfill the law to the T. 
the sinless one. And it means not just sins of commission, right, but also sins of omission. It's not just him refraining from committing bad things, but him also not leaving out to do right things, sins of omission and sins of commission, so lest he fall into a sin of omission, meaning you're supposed to go up to Jerusalem he goes up to fulfill the law. How many of you just meditate on that? When you see Christ just walking out what was required in the Old Testament, he fulfilled the law for us in our place. Our best attempt to fulfill God's law in our own strength is the equivalent of straight Fs. Maybe a D minus kind of pops above and then sinks back into an F. That is our best. That's why Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says even our righteousnesses, even our best days are still filthy rags to God if we're trying to earn something, earn salvation with it, right? Christ came and got the straight A pluses. So whenever you see him fulfilling the law, even if it's going, not just going to Jerusalem for a feast day, he was fulfilling the law that we not only broke when Adam broke it, but that we've broken daily and could never fulfill. He came and fulfilled the law to the T, then got on the cross and was crucified as though he broke every law in our place, right? So he goes up to Jerusalem, and verse 2, there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. The pool was called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. It had five porches. Bethesda means house of mercy. In this area, verse 3, lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, crippled, people born without limbs. Everyone was there. You can just imagine the pain, the moaning, the groanings, psychiatric disorders, every person, everyone, everyone with any kind of illness who had no hope went to this place as their last place of hope. Why? Because it was believed, there was this superstition, verse 4, that an angel would come down at a certain season to the pool in the middle of this area and trouble the water, and whoever touched the water first was made whole of whatever disease they had. So verse 5, a certain man was there, and he had an infirmity for 38 years. We've spent the last three weeks talking about this, and honestly, I believe this is a story we can't talk about enough because this man is there, and he's crippled. He's been crippled, the Bible tells us, for 38 years. More so, after Christ heals him and causes him to walk, he tells him in verse 14, sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you, seeing that Christ only said that to another person in the gospel account, which was the woman caught in adultery, we can conclude that this person was crippled for 38 years because of some kind of sin. Tradition says it was most likely a sexually transmitted disease. And what's amazing is there's a multitude here, and I keep saying it because we need to just be rocked by the love of God and the grace of our Lord, one might say in their mind that truly, if he was only going to go for one person, go for the one, right, who's at least innocently crippled, meaning they were born that way, it was out of their control, they came out the womb that way, you know, and then if there's time, right, and maybe on the second visit or the tenth visit, then go to the person who's actually crippled because of doing something wrong and dabbling in darkness, but what does Christ do? He comes to seek and save that which is lost. He goes after the one. That's the one he chooses. Wow, right? So, he asked the person, do you want to be made whole? Verse 6, he's not speaking to the person's ability because the person has no ability. He's speaking to desire. Do you want to be made whole? The impotent man, verse 7, starts making excuses. I don't have anyone to help me. Whenever the water gets troubled, someone gets there first. And we talked about how Christ's love cuts right through our excuses, cuts right through. Even if you just get triggered into the minute healing comes up, the minute deliverance comes up, the minute just a new beginning in your life comes up, you just get triggered. Just like at the doctor's office, to hit the knee is for the reflex to go. You just as a reflex always go right into something about your life, something involving being failed, let down, a victim of something, and look at what Jesus does. He cuts right through it. And he cuts right through all of our jargon as well. Isn't that amazing that we don't worship and love a Lord who says, hey, articulate your jargon better. <laughs> Come back with that. 
You know, pre- bad presentation. Present it better. No, he just cuts right through it all and says, rise up and take up your bed and walk. And immediately, verse 9, the man was made whole. For 38 years, he's been crippled. Jesus commands him to get up. And we talked about how the Lord will never command us to do something without giving us the strength to do it. He will never command us to do something without giving us the strength. Otherwise, it'd be a bad joke. If he just said to the man, yeah, get up. Then he said again, get up. Without giving him the strength, it's just a bad joke. Isn't it the same thing? Look at all the commandments of God. Without God's spirit to help us, it's just a bad joke. But he will never command us to do anything without giving us the strength to do it. So he gets up, and it tells us clearly, verse 9, you ready? And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and it was the Sabbath day. Let's just look at verse 8 and 9 one more time to really set the scene here. Verse 8, Jesus says to him, rise up. He's telling a crippled man, get up. But then he says something else. Pick up your bed and carry it. Jesus just commanded someone what looks like to break the Sabbath. Remember on the Sabbath, it was a day that God had designed in the Garden of Eden as a day of rest. It was a day, six days thou shalt work, but on the Sabbath day it should be a Shabbat, a day of rest. Well, what the religious mafia had come along and done was they made it into a day where instead of it being a day of rest and reflection, it was a burdensome day because you had them walking around blowing whistles all day on who was doing work. And what started happening was the tradition became more important than the person. How many people today hate church, want no parts of church, have been deeply hurt in church because they were in a church that had become religious just like these Pharisees where the traditions of the church are actually more important than the people. The furniture is more important than the people. The white gloves is more important than the person who showed up to be an usher without the white gloves. And don't get it twisted like it's all about churches that wear suits and churches that have white gloves with ushers, right? Because you could be in a non-denominational church wearing hoodies and, and still figure out a way to do something weird with hoodies, right? It's just what sinners do, you feel me? So let's not turn it into, oh yeah, us, you know, that's why I'm non-denominational. We wear Timberlands and hoodies here. No, we'll do something weird with that too, right? But Jesus is coming along and he is showing the value of life. And here are people that would have sworn they are obviously about the value of life, but all they were about was the value of traditions and the value of just keeping the status quo. Jesus came to shake all of that up. What happens when Jesus steps into a church and shakes up the church to really give it a litmus test. Do you really care about the value of life? You only have to be in a church for a little while before you learn how to talk the right way, amen the right stuff, laugh at the right stuff, right? You know, snap at the right stuff during this sermon, right? Uh, But then Jesus really gets in and really brings in elements to really challenge the church. Are you really about the value of life, or are you just about the value of a, a country club culture? And that's what Jesus came to do. That's why when you see this, you realize that, wow, there is nothing new under the sun. What Christ is up against here, he's still up against today, especially as we see in the American church. We're in the American church. It's everything is right, but we must battle because we could become so right, you become dead right. There's no life. It's called dead orthodoxy. It's right. Everything is right, but it's dead right. There's no life. And we have to remember what Jesus said. Can we go to Matthew chapter 25? I think it does us all well to read this and actually reflect on what the heart of Jesus is all about. What the heart of Jesus is all about. Let's go to Matthew 25, please. And let's go and let's start at verse 34. It's talking about when Christ returns and him bringing judgment at his return. Ready? Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35. Because I was hungry and you gave me meat. 
I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. I had nowhere to sleep or where to lay my head at night, and you took me in and let me live with you. I was naked, and you gave me something to wear. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Verse 37, then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Verse 38, when did we ever see you with nowhere to sleep and took you in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come unto you to visit you? Verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, in so much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Isn't it amazing that we've fallen so away from the heart of Christ in our liturgy of service that you can be a church that's feeding hungry people, clothing naked people, giving thirsty people something to drink and taking in people that don't have anywhere to sleep and you have questions to answer. <laughs> Is that something? Think about it. That really shows you when Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, the same way they see a man who's crippled walking. They should be saying, yo, we'll carry your mattress. Forget about that mattress. It's the Sabbath day, man. Just drop it there. Let's go celebrate. Let's celebrate life. It's all, they, Jesus has to explain it. So please understand that when he says we must beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, we have the same thing to contend against today. Let us all, let us all pray and ask the Lord to show us him, show us his heart, show us where he's at today. They have a song called Jesus Walks. Like, where do you walk today, Lord? I think a lot of people would be shocked. I don't think Jesus is spending a lot of his time in the theological uh, coffee shops. I think that's a place he passes through. But as our Lord, who never changes, says he came to seek and save that which is lost. Where's the Lord? He's among the lost. Where's the Lord? He's leaving the 99 always at looking for the one. And if we're being conformed into his image and likeness, we should be one always looking for the one. We should be one always looking for the lost, always hurting for the lost. But we're settling for this Christ-like conformity that somehow just looks like just talking a lot of good theology. And the better you sound and the sharper your theological sword, and don't get me wrong, everything begins with a good theology that we somehow forget that that's just the huddle, and now what plays are you going to run? That's just understanding the playbook. What plays are you going to run? So the man has just been healed. It is the Sabbath day. And remind you, look at what Jesus is doing. He is shaking up the religious cage on purpose to get them to see the value of life. Because he could have said to the guy, get up, rise up, rise up and walk. Now, it wasn't breaking Sabbath to get up and walk. It was breaking Sabbath to get up and pick up your bed. He could have said this, get up and walk. It's the Sabbath, leave the bed. You know, shh, they'll get upset. They'll get mad. They're, they, they're not there yet. I'll, 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 have angel, I'll have one angel watch it all night. Come get it at sundown of Shabbat. He could have said that. But what does he do? He says, rise up, pick that up, and carry it with you. That's gangster. Yo, love is gangster. Agape love has to be gangster. Because often what you're being gangster again is not the world, not the prostitutes and the demon possessed. No, you, you got to be gangster against religion. Yeah, do y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So it's the Sabbath day. So therefore, look at verse 16. The Jews were persecuting Jesus, and now they wanted to kill him because he had done this on the Sabbath day. There's, they have two beefs. One, that Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. They said, that's work. The second beef is you told that man to carry something. You commanded another person. You broke it, then you commanded someone to break it. Look at this. So 
Jesus answers them, verse 17. And from verse 17 unto verse 47, for the next 30 verses, it is the Lord engaging them in a very high level rabbinical way of discoursing, but he's really just leveling into them and declaring it. And can I just share something with you? Even while Jesus is doing this, he's even, guess who else is lost? It's not just those at the pool of Bethesda. Oh, and oh, by the way, here's this obstacle called the religious mafia. He's seeking to even save and change them, even as they're looking at him. Please understand that. You must make sure that in your mind, because, right, when you love somebody, like, look, bottom line, right? You saw my daughter come up on the stage. You know, when we're just walking, I can't help it. It's just like, anyone looking at my daughter wrong? When you love somebody, you don't want anyone to hurt you. She even has a thing. Well, if someone says something to her, she'll tell mommy, don't tell dad, you know? When you love someone, you naturally don't want anyone to hurt that person. We have to make sure, because these Pharisees hurt our Jesus. Yes? So we can, in our minds, put them in this place like, oh, there's Zacchaeus, the, the stick-up kid, you know, and there's this person, and there's, you know, this uh, person, and then there's these folk. Just can we get them out the way? Like, boo, boo. But you have to realize that Jesus, even while pronouncing some woes upon them if they don't repent, his heart is breaking for them just as much. God, this is the love of God, and we have to remember that. How many of you needed to hear that? Because it's just, it's just easy to just kind of make up in your mind that, you know, they're to be hated. Everyone else gets love, but, but the Pharisees, let's hate them together. Let's just read and see what Jesus is going to do. So, Jesus says this in verse 17. He says, my father works and I work. What he's saying is, my father, because they come to him and say, we're going to kill you, essentially, at least with their eyes, because you broke the Sabbath and because you commanded a man to break the Sabbath. What do you have to say for yourself? So picture now Jesus is around Bethesda, somewhere around the temple area, right? He's there, and imagine, this is now one of the Jewish feasts. This is no small crowd around him now. And I, I'm sure it is not two or three of the religious mafia present he is surrounded. There is an audience here, not to mention people running to see this man who everyone knew was crippled for 38 years. And when they come to Jesus, you know, explain yourself. You just worked on the Sabbath and you just commanded someone to carry their mattress. You commanded. What are you? What rabbi are you from the country of Galilee? You broke the Sabbath and you commanded a man to break the Sabbath. And here's the answer Jesus gives them. My father's always working. Look at this. Verse 17. My father is always working and therefore I'm always working. Notice what he said to them. Yes, in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 when teaching us the Lord's prayer, the Lord said that we should pray our father. He's saying my father. He's telling them from the gate I have a relationship with the invisible father that you're not even in. See what I'm saying? This is now the second person of the triune Godhead. God the Son speak in human flesh. And Isaiah tells us he came in a very nondescript body. Just looks like another nondescript stonemason, carpenter, itinerant rabbi. Blends in with everybody. No high pro glow, no extra swag, no like, you know, New Jerusalem like strut. Just a, looks like a regular mo. And here he says to them, my father. My father's always working. Therefore, I'm always working. They got, and you have to understand, in rabbinical talk, they see exactly what he's saying. See how we could just read through this and it kind of, some of it just like, okay, next verse, please. Okay, praise God, next verse, please. They get what he's saying, and look at this. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought even more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but then he said here that God was his father, meaning his father in a unique way. And they understood that he was making himself equal with God. As you read this, It's going to keep flopping between majesty and modesty. You're going to see him say, my father's always working, therefore I'm always working. But then you're going to see him say, 
I can only do what the Father does. You see, and remember we read, great is the mystery of godliness, right? 100% God, 100% man. All God, all man, all the time. You know, the God of glory cloaked in perfect humility, omnipotence, who says, I am God and there's none else, yet wrapped in perfect humility, self-existent, yet to come and fulfill what Adam did wrong gave up all divine prerogative to make himself totally dependent. So you're going to see it go between majesty and modesty, superiority, the Father's greater, and equality. But again, the only way you have to keep saying in your head as you read this, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And you have to just pause and say, he did all of this to save my soul. That, that's, how, that's how it gets sweet. That's how you keep it from just being like 36,000 super cerebral. He did all of what I'm reading. He did all of this to save me. He did all of this to make me his. The Father works and I work. You see, God, and this is the, the three themes you're going to see here. Please write them in your notes. Creation, meaning the giving of life, right? Providence, day-to-day -day providence, meaning keeping meteors from coming through the atmosphere and just pummeling small islands and uh, uh, ending large city populations, feeding the birds, balancing ecosystems, um, holding all of our cells together. You know, we can get, you know, our brother Josh up here, who's a chemist, to really talk about quantum theory and uh, the nuclear force and what is holding all of that together. There's creation, that's providence. And then there's judgment, right? The Jewish people would say, only God can give life and only God can judge at the end of life. What Jesus is going to be saying in this sharing is I give life and I am the judge. Now do you see as we're going to read this how weighty this is? That's why when the Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, when the Mormon knocks on your door, when even the teachings of Islam say, you know, that Jesus is not God, and there's no place even in the New Testament where he directly says he's God, there are numerous places where Jesus clearly is saying he is God, and ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, John chapter 5 is one of them. My father's always working, so I work. On the Sabbath, when Adam and Eve rested, did God cease from work? What would happen if God took one day off? What would happen if God took one day off? Because guess what? People were born on the Sabbath, right? There's a whole world and a Milky Way and galaxies and ecosystems and a whole food chain to supply and provide for. Imagine if God took a day off. What he's saying is, my father doesn't take a day off and I don't take a day off. Now do you get what he's saying to them? Let's keep reading. Verse 19, then answered Jesus and said to them, verily, verily. What he's really saying is this, amen, amen, and don't ever forget what I'm about to say to you. That's what he's saying. Verily, verily. We could read that and it's like, verily, 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 right? No, it's, it's amen, amen, and please do not forget what I'm telling you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son. Now, underline my Father underline the son he is speaking right as the son the promised one the messiah the seed of the woman god in the flesh the son at the baptism right this is my beloved son god's only begotten son remember john wrote in john chapter one no man hath seen the invisible god at any time but the son has come to declare that is why Jesus will say in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So one, he just said to them, God, the, my Father doesn't ever take a day off. Therefore, I don't ever take a day off. And they got right there that he just said he's equal with God. Right? Didn't they say that in verse 18? Now they wanted to kill him even more. But he's not done. Verse 19 he says, verily, verily, amen, amen, and don't forget what I'm about to tell you. The Son can do nothing by himself, but what he sees the Father do, underline that, what he sees the Father do, for what things soever the Father does, the Son does. 
He just came and told them. This is what he just said to them. First thing he said is, my father, my father, not our father, my father, in the unique relationship of God the Son to God the Father in eternity past, my father. Just picture the majesty. The, the, I, mean, I mean, do people inside their spirit man are just falling like dominoes, right? As the devil's just filling them with rage and whatever. But he's like, my father. Modesty and majesty perfectly meeting together. My father doesn't take a day off, so I don't take a day off. And then he says this, the son, the son, the only begotten son. He could do nothing on his own, but he does what he sees the father doing. Now he's telling them something else. I see, I see what the invisible father is doing. And what I see him doing, I do. Now he's just told them, I see everything the father does. You don't see everything the Father does. You got to go talk with uh, five, ten different people, read five, ten different books, you know, fast for five, ten different days, and then even then you're still like, well, I think the Lord might be doing this. He's like, I, I see what the Father's doing. <laughs> and whatever he does, I do. Wow. For the Father, verse 20, loves the Son. Whew, wow. And he shows him all things that he does. He says, you see, the father loves the son and he shows me all things. Right in your notes, what he just said, he shows me everything. He doesn't keep anything back from me. He shows me all things that he does and he will show him, he's speaking in the third person, even greater works than these so that you may marvel. He's saying, now look, all of us, even though I'm the pastor of this church, the founder of this church, right? Been a lot of places, seen a lot of faces. At the end of the day, I'm still looking for God to do stuff, right? Just like you, so that I may marvel, right? Even my prayer as I began the message was, you know, may the Lord rock all of us, right? Do you see what Jesus just did in setting himself apart? He's going to show greater things that you may marvel. <laughs> I don't need to marvel. I, need, I don't need the marvel at nothing. I'm God of very God. You're going to marvel at it. <laughs> the resurrection is going to blow you away, not me. <laughs> You're going to be studying it for all of eternity. And it says in the Bible, we'll still be learning of his grace even when we're in glory. You're going to marvel. I'm not going to marvel. Look at the majesty and the modesty. This is our Jesus. I mean, doesn't it make you say, wow, Lord, how crazy my arrogance must look like off of like having crumbs in comparison, right? Uh, uh, you know, in comparison, you know, we all brag and boast and we're in a culture of bragging and boasting, but all of a sudden you look at this, it's like, man, it's like we're just like bragging and boasting off of having like rotten sandwiches that rats have, have eaten. Like in comparison to, to, to his majesty, Lord, please let me be like you. Please let me be like you. But it comes down to, because he also came, remember, while God in the flesh declaring his deity, he also came to show us the example of what the perfect man should look like. So this humility we see here, this is actually the example of what God has in mind for us to look like when people see us. So let us both bow before him, but let us also look forward to and pray, Lord, make me like this. It's designed to make you say, Lord, I want to know you more, but Lord, make me look more like this. I mean, look at this. Look at the style. It's flawless. Is it not flawless? Would you just write in your notes, flawless? I mean, <laughs> flawless in how he just, you take this to any culture in the world, let it be read, all different languages, flawless, flawless. The father loves the son. He knew his identity. So much of what we get caught up in during the day, so much of how we get pulled and, oh my gosh, Lord, that was not like you, that was like this. So much of it just comes from not knowing our identity and not knowing how loved we are. I love that as he's speaking as God in the flesh, he's also speaking, you see the majesty, but then you see the modesty where he's just speaking as the perfect man, the father loves the son. He knew his identity, he knew he was loved. The core of so much... And really of everything for us is knowing how loved we are. Now do you see why Paul said in Ephesians 3 to the Ephesian Christians, when I heard of your growth, when I heard of how the church is exploding, I heard of all the great things you're doing, what did I do? I got on my knees and prayed that Christ 
would cause you to see his love for you, that you would know the length and the width and the breadth and the love of Christ that passes knowledge. What? What? Wait a minute, you said the church was doing great. Why would you pray that they would know how much they're loved? Because that is the core of it. That's its own message. Let's keep moving. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even though the Son quickens whom he will. Remember, as was correct in Jewish thought, they said only God gives life at the beginning and only God gives judgment at the end, right? How many people get tattoos, right? Only God can judge me, right? Popular tattoo of some other era. Maybe people still do it now. I don't know. But, you know, correct biblical thought. Only God can give life and only God can give judgment at the end. You see Jesus. Now do you see what he's, all he's harping on with these, in this sharing is giving life and judging, Now do you see why? It's not arbitrary. He's clearly through this whole thing making clear to them, you have a problem with me breaking the Sabbath, I'm God. And what you need to be doing is asking me for the correct view of everything instead of wanting to kill me because I don't fit in your view. And isn't that what happens whenever we have a fresh revelation of Jesus? We go from, you know, being all confident in the little boxes we have, and we judge everything for not fitting into our little religious box, and then all of a sudden we fall to our knees, and even if you've been saved 50 years, a fresh revelation says, you know what, instead of me talking so much, I need to just be, would you just show me once again everything? (laughs) That's what he's doing, so that they would literally switch gears and go to the place of learning instead of judging. So, as the Father raises up the dead and gives life, even the Son gives life. And look look at what he says, whom he will. He says, I can give life wherever I want. Now, we just saw him give life to the crippled man. We saw him give life to the woman at the well. We saw him, right, give life Right? Even when he's calling the disciples, he's giving life. He's saying, I could give life, and life looks like all different things. For the woman at the well, it was a life of freedom from shame and guilt. That's a resurrection. I gave our life a whole new way of thinking, right? He gave the man who was crippled life. I give life wherever I want. He says, as a father gives life, the son also quickens. I give life whom he will. Whoever I want to, I could do that to. That's what he just said. You're wondering what I did this on the Sabbath. One, God never takes a day off. Two, I could do this and give life anywhere I want. That's what he's basically saying to them. And they're saying he clearly is making himself equal with God. Verse 22, he goes on. For the father judges no man, but he's committed all judgment to the son. He just said to them, Yes, your line is that only God can give life at the beginning and only God can judge at the end. I'm here to tell you something. I give life wherever I want, and the Father does not judge anyone. He gave all judgment to me. This is, again, a set of verses where Jesus is saying over and over again, I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. Now, do you see now, as you read it now, it's not just arbitrary, deep stuff. It's very clear, and he's going right into high-level, rabbinical, theological thought. He's going to the crux of theological thought. I give life, and I'm the judge at the end. Who else could do that? Only God. I am God. Verse 23, and all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you. And here is, if you want to write in your notes, this is the sale. This is the sale, right? S-A-L-E, the sale. Because you're sitting and now you're like, okay, he just said that he gives life wherever he wants. He also just said that he is going to be the one who gives all judgment. How do I find life and how do I escape judgment? And now he's giving the cell here. Verily I say unto you, he that hears my word. What did he just do? He just put his word on par with everything in the Old Testament. He that hears my word. Now, can you imagine what this religious mafia is doing as they're hearing this? It's like punches and it's like 
you remember the same sun that can melt plastic also turns mud into brick. It's the sun, but it's according to the heart. Hearts are supposed to get softened under this. But when hearts want to continue to lean on, over into evil and rebellion, they get hardened. Those that are getting hardened, it's just like punch after punch after punch. He just said, God doesn't take days off. I don't take days off. God gives life wherever he wants. I give life anywhere I want. Oh, you said only God can judge you? It's almost like maybe even some of them were thinking it as he said it. Maybe one of them in their mind were like, only God could judge me. <laughs> you don't know. Then Jesus comes and says, all judgment's been given unto the Son. We can't even imagine the tension and how God is at work here, right? And then he says this, if you hear my word and believe on him that sent me, you have everlasting life. And you will not come into condemnation, but you will pass from death into life. He that hears my word and believes on him. You know, actually, the better translation would be, if you relax in my word, you will have everlasting life. So here we are as woe-begone sinners, knowing that we all deserve the judgment of God. And you're like, whoa, the more I read God's word, the more I know what a sinner I am. God is the judge. What is there for me? How do I escape so great a death? And what does he say? Relax in my word. Hear my word, relax in my word. That's what it does when you hear that, wow, God so loved the world, like our young children just said, that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And what do you do when you hear that? You believe it, and what does it do? You relax in it. If you're sitting here and you're like, I go to church, I, I do love the word. I mean, the enemy ever try to attack you late at night, tell you you're not really saved? Huh? Hey, what if, <laughs> what if you're in the middle of just minding your own business, right? Remote in hand, it's like, you, you, might, you might die and go right to hell. And you're like, well, wait a minute, well, how do I know? How do I know? Well, remember, the purpose of this gospel was that we can believe and have eternal life. He says here, if you hear my word, and if you believe on him, if you relax in this, meaning how do you know if you believe in it? When I talk about Christ dying for your sins and you having eternal life because you've received the love gift of Jesus being judged in your place, doesn't it just relax you? That's how you know. If you're here today and it's a relaxing thought, but you don't yet feel you're relaxing in it, then perhaps you have to receive Christ into your heart. But for those of us who've received Christ into our heart, you realize, wow, that is a great way to say it. it is a, it's a believing on it. But how do I know if I believe? How do I know if I believe? If you relax in it. If you, just like you lay back, a baby lays back in the arms of a father. If you lay back in this, then you have eternal life. Wow. Praise God for salvation. And you've passed from death into life. Verse 25, verily, verily, I say unto you, and look at this, the hour is coming, and underline this, and now is when the dead, underline the dead, will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear it will live. You know what's deep about that? He says this, the hour is coming. He says, in fact, the hour is actually right now as I speak when the dead are hearing the voice of the Son of God and coming to life. It's as though Jesus is saying, right among this hostile crowd, some of them are actually believing him as they're hearing it. And that's why he's saying the hour is coming. In fact, it's right now. When people even right now are what? Hearing the voice. When the dead, what's it mean? The spiritually dead. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear will live. I just love where the Lord, he's basically saying, some of you are relaxing in this and some of you are passing from death to life right now based on my word. Some of you right now are passing from death to life. Let me ask you a question, show of hands. How many would just love to have been here now that you're taken in this story just to watch all of what's happening and actually to see where he's not only showing them that he's deity and rebuking them openly, right? But he's also inviting them in to live. This is truly our Jesus. I don't know who's uglier in the gospel accounts. 
the ugly ones who were out living the way we lived in that form of ugliness or the ugliness of the Pharisees and Sadducees who are turning religion into something that's repulsive and so blind they can't even see it. But I tell you what, the Lord is equally loves them both and he's going after both. So when we want to be more like Jesus, are we realizing that we're not, it's not just a, you know, some people want to do it like an on-off switch. Like, oh man, show me the one that needs water to drink and that needs somewhere to be taken in and show me the one that's needy. Show me, the, oh yeah, I got to be like Jesus. Whatever you've done to the least of these. And then man, toward other church folk, toward people that are just saved, oh man, whatever, man, get your own drink. What up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, to the, to the visitor and to the hurting, how are you? You know, do you need a kidney? Let me see if my driver's license matches that. And, and, and let's find an, an organ for you. And then to the other person, man, get it yourself, man. What you doing in my seat? <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, hey, good morning. I mean, you got people still not saying good morning to people in churches. People still play that game like word. <laughs> really? Yo, if we really want to be like Jesus, you have to understand it is how we treat. And we all fall short, but it is how we look at everyone. Not just, oh, yeah, man, you know, man, the person that needs a hug and that, like clearly it's like a billboard for hug me. Oh, my gosh, let's all run and trip over each other to get to that person. But then, man, the, the person you stepped on to get to the person, you don't even notice. You make a sarcastic joke. Yeah, you know, get over it, man. You know, you know, <laughs> whatever. May the Lord help us to really, really see the more we see Jesus for who he is in his love in the religious circle and in the streets the more we are conformed into that image. How do you treat those that are outside in the world? You're willing to, oh, 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 you give them your last dollar. Oh, oh, I felt so close to Jesus when I gave that person my last dollar. But man, he won't even like pass the ketchup to someone in the church. Oh man, that person needs a hug. I'll hug them. Never mind, you know, if I've taken on oh never this thing. Oh, never mind. I know I got it in Europe. I don't care. I'll throw it away. But then someone in the church, they got a they, they, you see they're hurting and weeping, and you're just like, oh man, they'd be good. They heard Pastor Aaron preach today. Right? We have to make sure that if we really are studying this Jesus, who is basically he is going after everyone before him because he sees their value and that they are beloved of God, and he's come to seek and save and to love everyone. I mean, we could keep going, but I'm, we might need to wrap this up. Um, look, verse 26, as the father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself. Would you write here, self-existent. And here you see superiority, yet you see equality. He's saying, the father has given me to have life, but he's also saying, but I am self-existent. Do you see how you see the play between the majesty and the modesty and between the father being superior but equal? Understand this. The father is superior to the son, but only in office, right? Not in essence. God the son is just as much God of very God. God the Holy Spirit is just as much God of very God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, just as much God as very God as God the father. They are equal in essence, but in office, in office, the Father is greater. In a mystery that we only understand through God's revelation, in their relationship, God the Father is the Father, and the Son is the only begotten Son, and there's the relationship of eternal love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8, and in that it is decreed that God the Father is the Father as God always is and always was and always will be, and God the Son is the Son, and the Father is superior, but only in office they are equal in essence. Somebody once said, try to understand the Trinity, you might lose your mind. <laughs> but then someone said, try to explain it away and you'll lose your soul. <laughs> Try to understand the Trinity, you might lose your mind. Trying to explain it away, though, and you'll lose your soul. We don't have to understand something to believe it. I don't understand all of how gravity works, but when turbulence hits the plane, I still grab my two <laughs> armchairs, right? Because I respect it. I respect it. I don't say, oh, you know what? I don't understand this science stuff. I'm, you know, what is the gravitational force constant anyway? Uh, turbulence is nothing. Falling is nothing. Ladders are nothing. Bring them all on, right? Scared of heights is just an illusion. No, I don't understand gravity. 
but I don't have to understand something fully to respect it. And I love this too. If God were small enough for me to understand everything about him, he wouldn't be big enough for me to worship. Because see, if he's small enough for me to understand him, that means he's smaller than my brain. And I can't worship anything smaller than my brain. So we understand him. There's no confusion with it. But we must also just pause and say, my finite mind, whoa, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, but I believe it. Well, that's a great place to end. Let's have the worship team come up, and we're going to come in and read more of this next week and finish it up to even see where even in this exchange, Jesus even mentions the Antichrist, even mentions a coming world ruler. For those that think, oh, Bible prophecy is just people that take the Apostle Paul's writings out of context, Jesus comes and gives a lot of prophecy and more than once mentions a coming Antichrist, a coming world ruler, someone that will make Adolf Hitler uh, look like just... uh, a bad day in a given moment of time, not downplaying the Holocaust at all, but the scripture makes clear that the coming Holocaust will be even greater during the book of Revelation. Very, very sobering, especially having just come back from a Holocaust museum in Israel. But Jesus will mention this. So let's come back next week. And again, just for a moment, if you wouldn't mind, just close your eyes. Sometimes it just helps take off distraction. What do you see based on what we read today, right? Warren Wiersbe once said, you know, a good sermon turns ears into eyes. It's only by God's spirit that a sermon can be good. But in light of what we read today, we got rocked today. What do you see and what do you see differently about your Jesus, our Jesus? Just take a moment and let's ponder him because John 5 is just unbelievable. What do you see? What's wowed you today about our Jesus? What have you remembered that you've forgotten about our Jesus? What, what boxes, what boxes has, has have been exploded today by the magnanimous Jesus that we've shrunken somehow? The love of Jesus. And if you open your eyes when you want, but I'll just keep talking. Let us ponder Jesus. Before we run out into our busy day, and then what happened here in the last 45 minutes is just a memory, let's ponder Jesus. And then should come the prayer, Lord Jesus, would you please, please, please be all of John chapter 5 in my life? Would you please be the one that seeks out the worst one in the room, the one that seeks out the most undeserving person in the room? the one that speaks, do you want to be made whole? The one that cuts through excuses and just says, rise up and walk. The one that tracks us down because he cares about our spiritual growth, hunts us down, and then just stands after being so low as to touch us and to speak to us by our name, stands back and says, the universe can't even hold me. I'm God Almighty. Lord, would you please tattoo our hearts and minds with today's revelation of you? We so need to know you more, and we're here to say that the only one good is you, the only one awesome is you, the only one just everything is you, and thank you that you came and did all of this to save us so we could be yours. Thank you so much. Lord, receive this worship now as we sing. Lord, receive this offering this morning of all you give to us. Thank you that we can give to you. And Lord, just continue to walk among us and continue to make us and make this church look more like you. We don't want the religious cheap substitute that comes from just a busy life and winging it based on Bible we know. No, Lord, we don't want any cheap substitutes in our lives, in our homes. Would you show us where we're settling for cheap substitutes? Lord, we want to be more like you. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for meeting us at our own Bethesda over and over and causing us to rise up in ways we never imagined. 
Thank you for being in control of our life and every detail of it. And would you just remind us that you're in control. And Lord, we love you. We thank you for all the above in Jesus' name. Amen.